welcome to another edition of Turned at a Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham. And once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but it had their life changed by the genre in a major way, even if they don't want to admit it. Today on the show, a huge episode from the band The Magnetic Fields. Claudia Gonson and Stephen Merritt are on the podcast. And this, buckle up, this is a good one. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turnedatapunkpodcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and the show's producer and your guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham, and you will get the message to me. You can also find me on uh, X, Twitter and Instagram at left for Damien. This podcast is on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. I said Instagram and uh, there's probably something I'm forgetting, but all those are at turned at a punk on those platforms. And if you want to support the show, tell all your friends about this podcast, let them know that there's this podcast and, uh, you, you know what to say. Uh, you can also check out the band I play in. There's more information to be found at fuckedup.cc. We have a new record. Uh, no, not uh, a new one. Uh, I might have uh, made a spoil something there, but we got a reissue of uh, David Comes to Life, which is out now. You can pick that up there. Uh, all sorts of stuff. Tour dates. I don't think we've announced any there. Oh, maybe. Well, I, don't know. I don't know what I'm not supposed to talk about, what I'm supposed to talk about. So head over to fuckedup.cc. Uh, looking for gold.blogspot.com and there's fucked up social media. I don't follow it, but there's, <laughs> there's fucked up social media you can follow too. All right. On to today's show. As I said off the top, Claudia and Steven from the magnetic fields are on the show today. And when Tristan told me that the magnetic fields people were into coming on this podcast, I was stoked, but I was also kind of shocked. Um, I didn't know there was a punk connection or anything like that at the time. I'm a huge fan of this band. If you do not know the Magnetic Fields, I do not know how to help you with that because this is one of the most significant bands to kind of emerge from, i got to pick my words very carefully, as you'll hear in a minute, uh, from uh, music, from music in uh, the last decades few decades incredible songs right from the very beginning with this band uh, they are celebrating the anniversary of their classic monstrously ambitious but sticks the landing uh, 69 love songs is there's a, a silver anniversary 25 years this thing has been out now that's wild. I remember this thing coming out and picking it up and just being blown away by this thing. Uh, Merge Records is going to be reissuing it as a six 10 inch record set. Uh, it's going to be on silver vinyl. It looks awesome. This looks amazing. I'm going to pick this thing up. Uh, and well, uh, order it now, it says, because it's moving fast. So order yourself a copy of this anniversary edition, the silver anniversary, I guess. 25 years of silver. I should probably know this thing. Um, I, I think so. Uh, mag the magnetic fields are also going to be going on tour. A lot of these shows are selling out. Uh, so find your tickets now for them. You can head over to mergerecords.com and, uh, slash, uh, magnetic fields. I'll just go to mergerecords.com. You'll see the magnetic fields tab and you can click on it and, uh, get yourself some tickets to these shows before they all sell out. Stockholm, Toronto. I'm looking at the dates right now. Well, if you're in one of these cities, count yourself among the uh, blessed that you get to see this thing. I'm not going to ramble on anymore. As you can tell, my voice is shredded. I'm up late podcasting, just living that life. I haven't even done a show or recorded in a long time. This is just voice stress from doing podcasts. Oh my gosh. Well, anyway, I'm not going to ramble on anymore. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Stephen and Claudia on Turned Out a Punk. Claudia and Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're oh. welcome. 
It is a an honor to have you both here. You guys are uh, a band I'm a huge fan of. The, the records you put out for years and years and years. But to my own ignorance, never placed you in the punk context until recently. And oh my gosh, do I have a lot of nerdy shit to get to. <laughs> uh, well, but- I think Distortion maybe is our post-punk album that actually makes sense to describe as in relation to punk and ordinarily we are not especially in relation to punk so much as we're in relation to irving berlin so um you know we we have our moments um but that's not how we identify particularly um i identify as a variety artist and i don't know how claudia identifies um uh, but I expect she'll tell us. Um, uh, how do I identify musically? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, what band do you think you're in? Flower Child, Melanie. I think I am Melanie. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I, I will push back. Obviously, it's your band, so don't take this, <laughs> take this with a grain of salt. Uh, I do think you are a punk band. And I think, because to me, punk eventually gets codified and people take it up differently but are very adamant of it has to be this thing or that thing but to me it's 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 about disrupting what it means to be a musician what it means to be a quote-unquote rock star what it means to be just just making art in this sort of commodified version of this thing and that's why as soon as i found out that there is sort of this and i a ten, like tenuous punk connection it, it rang so clear to me that you are a punk band because that's what your band has done throughout my entire period of listening to you how is that different from just rock and roll in general because most rock and roll bands want to be famous and they follow a code like i was thinking about this because mo tucker i was reading about mo tucker today and and then the original uh velvet's drummer who quit because he thought they sold out when they played their first paying gig in Mm -hmm. 1965 there's this sort of two streams of this rock music and i think you even bring it up in that documentary where you talk about cinema verite and the influence of cinema verite and trying to like reflect real life in a way and an authentic life versus rock and roll mainly pop rock and roll which is all about edifice and sort of building up this edifice and hiding what's real yeah i think authenticity is a silly marketing gimmick and i want nothing to do with it (laughs) (laughs) this is gonna be awesome i i did have a um conversation with steven about um you know and he and i might disagree on this and i welcome that but that that when i first met steven zines were the way that we got sorry about that loud siren coming by it's new york city like i don't don't hear Uh, it oh okay good yay zoom um that zines were really our primary mode of getting information a lot of the time and so we got into bands in certain scenes outside of New York, like in New Zealand and in UK and in California that were a lot of them um, sort of spearheaded by pretty visionary. Um, I mean, I'm saying this as a, as a music manager, I guess I, I have a kind of a specific way of looking at things, but I, I was just thinking about people like Jeff Travis, you know, who started Rough Trade and Blanco and Negro. And I was thinking about people like Alan McGee, who started Creation and um, Roger Shepard, who started Flying None. And these are all record, like sort of not just record labels, but sort of scenes that were very, I think what in that mythology you're talking about of like DIY collectivism. Um, my one favorite band in high school was this band called the Raincoats who are like very, you know, they, they were very much um, punk in that way that I think you're talking about, which is sort of like this uh, just, uh, I don't know, like, I guess not very, what am I trying to say? It's not authentic. I don't. Th- I think Stephen will bridle at the word authentic, but certainly an effort being made to express something. Yeah. He's like, ah! um, but um, but you know, but, like like, so like just, at just, the same like, time, the raincoats are so unpunk in the in the sense of um, uh, the the association with aggression um, right. and being louder than. Uh, previously thought possible um they had a i I feel like they're at least as much a a feminist project as a as a punk band yeah Um, that's that's, i think what i'm very maybe that's part of what we love about them right 
I think that's actually what I'm saying is my kind of tangential metaphorical maybe way of talking about punk is like the idea of like carving, you know, working against a system and carving out a new space. And the raincoats were certainly them and the slits and, you know, Huggy Bear and so many of these Kleenex. They, they were all kind of, you know, there was a lot of pushing back going on in that world. Yeah. Well, I, I think those are two scenes I really wanted to touch on with you. The Dunedin yeah. sound stuff and kind of like the 53rd and 3rd vaseline's shop assistants kind of i guess twee for lack of a better term stuff yeah. in england because well, me... for me everything i ever knew about edinburgh i read in the enemy and uh, but everything i ever learned about dunedin i learned in the record store because there there was no press coverage at all that i ever saw in the u.s of new zealand right uh, i still have never really seen I, I haven't even seen a roundup of the the who Chris Knox recorded. It, it you just don't get that in the U.S. Um, whereas we did get NME, which was great um, when NME was, you know, great, three. great, yeah. <laughs> and I think we also um, maybe the scene was small enough that we sort of caught these bands when they came to town, right? Like so, the, right. when um. Built her space, which was um, Hamish Kilgore from the Cleans band after that showed up in Boston in, I don't know, 90, 89 or something. It was so long ago, right? 90, negative numbers. Negative numbers to 90 um, with the bats. And, and also I was just thinking like the Clean very much in my mind, I think of as a punk band. I don't know. Uh, sure. Chris Knox very much I think of as a kind of a punk artist, you know, like a very like... I'm going to walk around in my Bermuda shirt and my bare feet and in the middle of winter and like just, you know, just, I don't know. It, it, I guess it is a little bit tangential to punk as in like, you know, Jerry's kids or something, but it's, it's its own kind. And I think maybe that's what you're referring to a little bit. So uh, maybe Jerry's kids don't have a, a, any more of a claim on what punk is yeah. that Blondie does. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what I was trying to get at earlier is that there is, the sort of macho bravado to rock music. And it's disrupted by bands like the the shops and, and very much like the, the Dunedin stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry, but if you could, if like me, you consider rock music to be basically an invention of Little Richard, macho bravado is not part of the origin story. And, and that's why I think punk is. It's bringing it back to where it's not, it doesn't have, like this is all put on it because it's all marketing, sex sells, yeah misogyny cells like all this shit is like forced on and that's when the clean were on this podcast a, a fantastic conversation with them i really do feel like they 100 percent were like we are a punk band and this was their reaction to the bullshit they were dealing with they were being beaten up by car culture dudes all the time and they were like having to deal with with this kind of stuff so for their their ver version of punk was going softer like why would you go harder why don't you just go completely against what these people want and what these people are doing yeah, yeah. yes All right and toy love are singing about bisexuality and sneaky feelings are singing about paul verlaine it's yes. it, <laughs> yeah. very punk. not a macho scene yeah right. um what we think of as new zealand punk but actually the vast majority of things on the flying non-box set which i have to say i can't stand um <laughs> are macho cult culture our I, culture I, yeah. I think i think you're right like it kind of goes on and that's the sad evolution of punk is that at a certain point the industry subsedes and kind of like just takes this shit away from from the purity of it but then that's the great thing about punk is that there's a zeitgeist that you can't hold on to as a band and eventually there'll be a younger purity. group of kids purity <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I'm using these words. You're going to take me on up on all these fucking words. Um, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> I know. I love it. This is, uh, this is why I want to talk to you because I feel like the stuff of the type of music you're making, especially in Boston at that time, like the, the type of punk that's taken up pop culturally from what Boston, well, that Middle East show that you played with Buffalo Rome mm -hmm. way back when, and we sort of like Buffalo the connection. Rome. I don't think Steve knows about this, but there's a YouTube of very, very old. Um, 84. 80 something. <laughs> no, it's not that early, but 
<laughs> uh, we're old. We're not that old. Is, is 86? No, it's definitely like 80s though, right? Yeah, I don't mean to be getting no, it's it cool. wrong. Okay. But, um, it, has, it has Johnny Blood playing the Ream bass synthesizer. And, uh, and oh, um, I didn't yes, realize that was called Buffalo Room. So it was you it and is. me, Johnny and Amy Clark. Amy Clark being the singer, yeah. It's really okay. Amy Clark and I went to like, you know, we were like to each other from when we were like 14. It's like, this is old stuff. This is like high school, maybe late high school. What is she doing now? She's a teacher in San Francisco. That's so punk. Anyway, um, what's that? <laughs> She's very happy. Yeah, that's so punk. <laughs> that is so punk. Yes. She she deals with little children all the time. I was just off mic uh, talking to Damien about happy flowers singing, uh, singing I want to watch cartoons at the top of their lungs on stage, which is a very punk rock song in the fact that it's like a temper tantrum. I, I kind of have jumped way ahead because I want to I wanted to go back to this high school period that we're talking about. Uh, how did you both get into punk? Like I know you both met in high school, but like we and did not, not punk. get into punk. <laughs> you did. Oh, no. I have never been into punk. Wild I stare. Now into punk. Did you like? I, did you like? I like the... music in general. I, I I don't give a shit about the stupid labels. Okay. I but believe I, punk I, is a I, marketing I, category. And it's completely cynical, just like grunge. And uh, I, I, I think, like, frog rock is a descriptive term, derogatory but descriptive. Punk is a marketing scheme. We'll um, get to this. And has a hundred different meanings to to people. And when people want to use it and think it's warm and fuzzy, um, they have one set of meanings and uh, when they want to dismiss something they have another set of meanings and i just don't think it's musically useful at all um but i'm happy to talk about why i would i can't wait to get this so i guess claudia how did you get in a punk do you remember the first time you came across it well i mean it's it, i i agree with steven that neither steven or i really identify as punk people like we we don't have a lot of records in our record collections that are punk but um i mean i have an old well okay i talk- don't <laughs> I do, but, but only because I have a huge record collection. We talked about we talked about dozens of punk bands it's already. True, it's true. I just don't I, I don't define as a punk. I define as a hippie or a or a folky or whatever. But but my older sister growing up was actually defined herself as a punk. She went to hardcore shows. She was a photographer at hardcore shows. She has an amazing, impressive line of hardcore photographs, which she shows around town now and. Um, People get into the nostalgia of all of the stuff she did in the Boston hardcore scene and and around, and she which um, would horrify the people who were there at the time. Yeah, and she she yeah. you know would go to uh, all age shows in um, churches in Harvard Square that they had to cover up the stained glass you know windows because the kids would just go crazy and explode everything. Um, yeah, just throw throw them their bodies everywhere. I hid with terror from the punk world, and um, but I did absorb it, I guess, through that. And I think that if if I really started to identify with punk stuff, it was more through the lens of what we were talking about um, earlier, which is like bands that, um, you know, were just like pushing against the, like the, the Raincoats really were like my favorite band ever in high school. Like I just, I just adored the Raincoats. I know they only had like three albums, but I just adored them. And um, I actually went in, 19, in 1987, I got on an airplane to find them. Like I actually went to London knocked on the door of rough trade and asked to see them because I love them that much. And I wanted to give them, you know, my cassette. And, um, and I did, I did, they opened the door and, and there was Mike Holdsworthy, who's Gina Birch's husband. And he said, sure, want to come to tea. And we went to tea and I hung out with Gina Birch. It was really a highlight of my life. Um, so, so yes, in that sense, like if you, if you, if we can put these sorts of feminist bands and these sorts of collective record companies, I and mean, we haven't talked about the UK, but I think Stephen and I, don't really identify so much with the U.S. punk scene, but I think that we would vaguely identify with the U.K. world. I don't know if it's even called punk, but, you know, people like Tony Wilson were being pretty punk. And in that way, I know I'm using this word very vaguely, but so what they were calling it was post-punk. Right. So maybe we're a little bit more. They were not considered punk. They were considered post-punk. And we were aware that Susie Sue and Robert Smith and all these people were identifying themselves as punk, but they were being branded as goth, new wave, whatever, you know. So so there was 
I guess there's a there's a there's that. And we even like had a little relationship for five seconds with Malcolm McLaren. Like we we do have like our own strange ways that we have inter interwoven with this world, but it's um it's not in the most traditional way. I I I like I've yeah, and please, Stephen, I don't mean to upset you with this thing, but I think mm -hmm. punk is more like a religion because you're right. Everyone has a different definition of it and it's fucked up and it's terrible. I definitely admit that there's Nazis bullshit that comes in with punk. There's horrible shit that comes in with punk, but there's also this moment that you're kind of talking about Claudia, where there is this door that opens and it's the desperate bicycles. Like as much as the buzzcocks have the first quote unquote DIY punk record, it's really that desperate bicycles single where they say at the end it was cheap it was easy go do it and lay out how you put your own seven inch and the story is that john peel played it and the next day rough trade sold 25 copies and those 25 people were the nexus right of that scene that to me is punk like those so diy for what, what Stephen and i would call more diy or collectivism oh i can definitely i can definitely relate with that one with the magnetic fields because when we started we had a record company which was us me, Stephen, my mother, his mother, and our friend Diana <laughs> all put in like 100 bucks or whatever and made a bunch of cassettes. And we had them done down at the tape complex. And then we hand put the tape covers on each one. And we had been doing this for years before that with cassettes that we never released. But this was the very first Nightingale Fields album. Oh, it bus. Is just, uh, it's just flashed into my mind for the first time in decades. My uncle wanted to put money into that. <laughs> he wasn't cool enough. So I said, no. <laughs> yes, it was very much a, a like, who's going to, who's going to invest. And the so I, and I want to, I, I want to bring up the coolness factor. Um, punk versus cool. Um, I, I feel like punk and new wave are these labels where if you identify as one uh, at, at one point in in my uh, youth you you weren't supposed to be both like you you, you weren't supposed to uh, say i like punk and new wave no no that was like uh, mods and rockers uh, but now they're completely the same thing um but so what what I would have said that I liked in the late seventies would have been new wave. Um, and I, I would have said that's talking heads, Blondie Ramones, um, and anyone with a synthesizer television other wire than, <laughs> other than Rick Wakeman. Yeah. I also like Rick Wakeman uh -huh. and still do, but it wasn't new wave with Rick. It Rick was Rick. not considered new wave. Because uh, on that, um, remember that song by Great Plains, why do punk rock guys go out with new wave girls? Yeah. Letter to a fanzine, it's called. That's a great example of the dichotomy that Stephen is talking about. Um, right, and uh, second verses is, isn't my haircut really intense? Isn't <laughs> okay, a genius in a sense? <laughs> Great Plains were a really great punk band, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, another band I wanted to bring up, that's not, I guess it's close to the new wave thing. And I think you guys cover it on the Cooking for Priests tape is yeah. that Wild Stare band that was on Propeller yes, Records. Wild Stairs. Yeah, yeah, they were, I would say that they would identify themselves as either punk or uh, experimental post punk or something like that, right, Stephen? Uh, I would have to ask them, but they did have a drum machine. So uh, I think new wave would be a more uh, cozy category for them well that is, is that's interesting too because i find boston out of all the scenes kind of has like are you familiar with lord manual that's someone i just recently learned about really kind of outsider electronic records he did one single with his his sister called like electrica or something 70 late 70s but he's backed on that lord manual stuff by la Peste, like that sort of first wave boston punk band that matter reissued mm -hmm. way later so there is this moment where it does feel like the two things were kind of aligned a little bit more. And I think V too, uh, Susan Enway's band, rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that band also feels like they kind of straddle that line. Well, we thought they were new wave, but whatever. Um, 
uh, we would never have hired Susan anyway if we knew that she was punk. <laughs> she actually ended up becoming like a, a Irish folk. So, you know, it really yeah, is like right. she was Celtic. She was a Celtic uh, folk person yeah. the whole time. Which you can tell by listening to her voice. You know, her voice is very lilting and kind of Irish y. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, I think your point, I actually, I don't think it's worth belaboring this endlessly. Like, I get your point, you know, that there's this sort of do it yourself, um, uh, trying to push against restraints of uh, trying to do things in the, or or maybe just not imagining that we could, you know, like in the early days, like how, how on earth are we going to get a record deal? Oh, we have to make a whole lot of tapes and send them to people and beg them to release our singles. But the, the it was easier, I guess, although now there's the internet, so maybe it's much easier now, but... But another thing that we did along with making all those cassettes at the tape complex and hand doing them and mailing them out. And then we made CDs, a thousand. That's what we got the money for, the thousand CDs. We called ourselves pop-up records and we because we like pop-up art. And and then we were able to license those things to other indie labels. So, so yeah, there was this sort of like doing it ourselves. I, I don't know how much that's punk, but that's certainly what we were doing. And another thing we did, because I don't know if anybody remembers the old, um, what were they called? Uh Xerox store, you know, the copy store was like a big, big part of early DIY music culture, like along with the record store, the copy store. Nobody gives them the credit they deserve. But not only did you make all your posters for your shows, but you actually made your, your records there. So we would go in and like our very first single, 100,000 Fireflies, was made at the copy store, you know, like just Xeroxed a whole lot of these beautiful, mag what was it, Stephen? It was like sort of, it was like a, a kind of a blue metallic cover that somehow we found a machine that did that and they created these then we put them on these sleeves and anyway the point is that everything is was very much handmade and i guess that on some level is a a spirit of punk in in its way in the sense that it was doing it yourself i i, I kind of feel like it's uh, I, I do think that do it yourself culture um dates back a lot further than 1977 Seven. Uh, but also i think it's really different in the u.s from britain in britain um like you said there's 25 people and that's a scene and it's london and uh it's the rec the rough trade shop mm -hmm. uh, um, or, or the punk scene on say on a uh, king's road right like you've got your yeah. the 100 club thing Where, whereas in in the u.s there's 50 major cities that that have their own little scenes and and um and we had gigantic uh roads between every pair of cities and that they just don't have that in in, in the uk it's um they're like they were two major newspapers and uh, jesus and mary chain was on the cover of the enemy before they ever had a even a right. tape out. The John Peel, yeah. They had only played live. Mm -hmm. And here we had uh, fanzines and touring, which we didn't really do, but there was... The and idea. no national magazines um, that had anything like NME or, or Melody Maker. Not until the 90s, right? Because then you get Puncture oh. and Magnet and stuff, but that's later, yeah. But then, then we had Op and Option and... Um, option and Op, yeah. Well, it's just looking at Search and Destroy uh from from the 70s and that was san francisco but that didn't even have we didn't know about search and destroy until research reissued it you know um because and in, in the us is so splintered um but in the in the uk doing something at rough trade records yeah constituted being in the epicenter of culture and there's just no equivalent of that. I mean, um, the epicenter of culture it, at the time in the U S was studio 54 and, um, 25 other things. Yeah. Uh, but there's no record store that was the epicenter of culture at all. It's fascinating in England, how much more, and maybe it's less so these days, but like back certainly in the in the heyday of these weekly magazines how much music culture especially underground music culture was just part of the larger pop culture there versus over mm -hmm. here where we're like yeah it was more accepted like you could have lawrence from felt or something showing up in some i i do think you're right about that 
it was a little less like here it's more like there's the upper and the lower and there was sort of more mushed yeah the same Lawrence from felt was boyfriends um with uh the singer of saint Jen. Yes. um right and uh he was uh he was played on john peel and john peel had 10 years earlier started dandelion records which is arguably the first uh, diy label in uh, uh, britain um i, I think John Peel's, we think of John Peel as a saint for the uh, punk alternative uh, yeah. period, but he was actually already a saint 10 years earlier. Uh, Dandelion was absolutely hippie music, um, but it was the same same technique. You know, if you have a radio show, you have oh, this a, is like, this a, is like that outrage. That, it's like that outrage that people feel when you learn that rap largely derives from disco it's the same feeling of like yeah right yeah. what that can't be <laughs> and you're like oh wait a minute look monica lynch you know works yeah. at in the disco world and writes a fanzine and then goes off and works at tommy boy for right years. and what do you think africa Bobato was playing at that party you know i i think that's the marketing that's been put on it the anti-hippie thing like it goes way back to the start but a lot of this stuff came out of hippie culture and like the amount of yippie people that manage bands or gave bands places to rehearse or do their shows like yeah and or like even pink fairies in england too and sort of this sort of uh freaky hippie scene the thugs in america like there is 100%. that right, they were a lot more confrontational than the sex pistols were mm -hmm. yes 100 percent. i i'm so glad you mentioned the thugs it, that's that's so right I, I was also just thinking about like that song roadrunner by modern lovers or um, early, obviously Velvet Underground. I mean, totally. You know, like there's this idea that their music was pretty punk, like early punk, but they were hippies. You know, like John, John Richmond is such a hippie. You know, so, I don't know. Yes, I'm. I'm pleased that you're making that connection because I obviously identify as a hippie, so it makes me happy. Um, <laughs> well, and and another thing I was thinking about because I woke up this morning singing Goo Goo Muck in my head at 6 30 and six o'clock in the morning i was sitting there singing gugumuk and i was like why am i singing gugumuk and i realized it was because i was thinking about the the thing that's always surprised me as i kind of get older and older about you know the ramones and the cramps and i guess maybe even the dickies but certainly we love the dickies by the way but certainly the ramones and the cramps is is that they're just nostalgically redoing the 50s you know like that song is like a 50s song and like you know, or or Rocky Horror Picture Show, or um, I mean, there's so many examples of this. You know, like this sort of nostalgia for the '50s, like doo wop scene done as punk, is um, unironic in my right. mind. In New York, we had the Peppermint yes. Lounge on Fifth Avenue and Fourteenth Street. There were there had been a few few different locations, but it was the it it was the '50s nostalgia for cool people. It was not Happy oh. Days. Yeah, it was the cramps. I, I think that the Ramones and the Cramps genuinely listen to this music growing up, and genuinely are writing this music. Except they're doing it in their like, holy shit! Like the seventies was a really bad decade. Like you know, like, you know, that's like a. It's, I don't know. It's just it's so or, or whatever the sixties did to them. You know, like it just strikes strikes me that there's a a nostalgia as well as an irony in there is what I'm trying to say. It's not just ironic like happy day or I don't know if ironic's the right word. But it's not just making fun there's like like i think when richard o'brien wrote wrote rocky horror he's actually doing 50s music like i think he's actually doing 50s music you know so it's i don't know i guess that just struck me like and so for some reason as i'm walking around the apartment singing goo goo muck that sure it's considered punk now but it's like it's kind of 50s music. <laughs> it's like, oh, definitely. Know. or like you know you mentioned the fugs but what was i just thinking of the trogs you know like there is this kind of like i don't know it's all evolves but um it's on some level unironically 50s, is what I'm trying to say. I was uh, on a Zoom call, my previous Zoom call to this one, uh, a month or two ago, was with Chris Stein and Deborah Harry. Yeah, and, them too, 50s. And Denise, Denise, they, and all that. And stuff. they were saying, yeah. we loved everything. Yeah. And we, still, we still love everything. We, we're not, we don't identify as a, a, a particular subset. We want to bring all of the music together and uh why label us 
that's my attitude. Um, but we don't have a preferred marketing category. Uh, we, we get put on particular lists, but uh, I don't know. We didn't put ourselves there. Oh, I, I think like people always say punk is this postmodern genre. And I think it is in the sense that it's picking from 50s rock and roll, like bringing in reggae, bringing in, I guess culture vulture would be the negative way of looking at it. But it is taking from all these different things and trying to construct something. And you're going to probably hate these words, authentic to these people, to yourself, like what is real. And I feel maybe it's not a sonic that unites it. Maybe it's sort of this idea of the the formal kind of rejection of the metrics of success and what it means to be a popular band like i see that with the fugs like they're swearing on those records it was never gonna get played on the radio velvet underground but more with jonathan richmond like jonathan richmond the modern lovers like there's this moment where he kind of just is, stops playing right like electric music he's like it's too loud starts putting pillows on the drums to mute everything and goes way more childlike in his approach but that to me is super punk. And that's sort of as if they were the proto punk. Right. Peruba did it. Peruba did it uh, before he did. Yeah. Before he did? Because he's doing it yeah, like. Yeah, I mean, they started singing happy songs about dinosaurs. And, yeah. John Richmond's doing it in like 77 by the time he's like, then the modern lovers break up. And he's like, no, I just want to play like old people songs. Oh, I, thought you, I thought you meant the, the later. Uh, 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 child childlike stuff oh yeah, yeah but i mean like but you're right like there's a, that sort of thing that also happens with perubu and there's this sort of uh wild happy flowers too like we were talking earlier claudia they're another band where it's it's nostalgia but it's i don't know there's something uh, well the, the thing that we none of us have brought up because we keep talking about authentic which just makes stevens so mad i'm so <laughs> it, yeah it makes him do this <laughs> thing would be to actually maybe bring up the idea of production anti-production production value like mm -hmm. you know when happy flowers is playing an instrument which with the beatles the invented on the white album mm -hmm. yeah which the beatles invented on the white album but but the point is like this idea of um we are actively going to make this not sound a way that your ears are used to we're going to do something either with swearing or with loudness or with quietness that is not in carol king tapestry is all about um the denial of the big productions that the original songs that she was doing uh, had been subjected to by herself. She had originally been making the Shirelles demos right. that turned into the records, and she uh, insisted that those records sounded like her demos, right. um, or she wouldn't work with those people again. Um, so she, she was... Originally, a big production uh, mover and shaker, and then went in absolutely the opposite direction 10 years later to do tapestry as absolutely minimal, no reverb at all, um, close miking everything. Uh, you, you never imagine that you're in a room at all. It's just aggressively... Strip like down. You, you, can, you can hear the saliva in her mouth. Um, that sounds like 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 trying to be real. I don't know if you would agree with oh, that. Oh yeah, that's like a side. That's like the first cousin of authentic. It's authentic, but, but it's also absolutely artificial because it couldn't have existed with the uh, technology of just ten years earlier. Um, right. She's using a sixteen-track right. tape um, and making everything is in your face. And that right. just didn't exist before. Um, and then the the Beatles were, you know, also for the White Album, they're subtracting all of this yeah. uh, George Martin. Basically, they're removing mm -hmm. George Martin's taste from their own uh, approach. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the, quickly they get so uh tangled up and against each other that phil specter uh mr production has to come and rescue them <laughs> um everybody's trying to get to that but yeah it's all uh, authentic right yeah it's all exactly as authentic as anything else but it's it's new technologies and a, a lot of the times a lot of the time with 
what we would like to call punk, New Zealand. Uh, it's old technology, like um, uh, Chris Knox recording the 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 chills and the bats and the sneaky feelings on his four track. That, yeah. um, that four track is what they were using to re record in 1967. Right. Uh, 15 years earlier um that was the the same kind of machine that they recorded sergeant pepper on but i think claudia you brought up earlier uh, this... that's, that's like if we were going back to adat now yes I th hey everyone for the past few months factor has been sponsoring turned out a punk which has been amazing because in addition to helping me bring this podcast to you each and every time it has also meant that I have had delicious, ready-to-eat meals waiting in our refrigerator. So for myself, when I'm hungry, I don't have to worry about what I'm going to cook myself. There's a ready-to-eat vegan meal for me. And for when my kids are hungry and they are eating anything but vegan, there's a meal ready for them too. Because each week there are 35 ready-to-eat meals ranging in all sorts of diets from vegan to non-vegan to keto to veggie to calorie smart ready, prepared, and delivered right to your door. And these chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals are ready in just two minutes. And you're saving money compared to takeout, and you can adjust how many meals you want from 6 to 18 delivered to your door every week. Plus, there are an additional 55 add-ons from smoothies to snacks, so you can have breakfast, midday bites and all sorts of other things so why not give these heat and ready to eat no fuss dietitian approved chef crafted factor meals a try head on over to factormeals.com slash taupe 50 and use the code toap50 to get 50 percent off that code is toap50 at factormeals.com slash toap Five zero to get fifty percent off, and thank you to Factor for supporting this show and, and feeding me and the kids. I think technology does play a big part in it too, though. Like the like you're saying the the advent of the photocopier um, yeah. and the the advent of the tape deck, and yeah. these bring the means of production of culture into the hands of young people and, and yes, artists. yeah, having having a cassette. I mean, I don't know if you guys did this, but you have the boom box and you'd sing into it and then you have a second boom box. This is like the Daniel Johnston recording method. And then you'd yep. play your cassette from one boom box into your other boom box. And you go back and forth. I, I made records that way for a little while. And when I was a child. Uh, I made records an analogous way for the first five magnetic field records. I had uh, a computer with a four channel uh, software. So right. I, I, I was recording on four track. It was just digital, bouncing, um, bouncing, and bouncing. I'd bounce it to DAT and back. Yes, I remember it well. And that's why we have no multi tracks. From, that's why we can't give records. anybody. Everybody's like, exist. "Oh, we want to put this in our television show. Can you give us the original, <laughs> original stuff?" No, I'm we like, can't. It's like Stephen made stew. Yeah, made a giant <laughs> stew. You can have the stew, or you can not have the stew. Right. But that's what it is. But you but can't no, have I, the I, ingredients. I do appreciate your point about cassette and the copy store. I hadn't really, I guess I hadn't thought of them as new, but of course they were new in the 80s. They were new-ish. You know, they weren't new, but they were new well, And you made your cassette on uh, on uh, four-track cassette deck. That was a new... I had my, my Tascam four-track, yep. Yeah. But before that, my I had... My four-track, the, 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 uh, my TAC A3440 yep. was from... I think probably 1970, but I got it in 1981. That, or that so. was quarter inch, like like cassette. Yeah. Quarter uh, inch. No, it was yeah, quarter, quarter, right? quarter quarter inch tape. Yeah, but uh, reel to reel. For some reason, we also had a big fascination with cray paws, which I have, it really has nothing to do with this conversation, except it's a little punk, I guess. We used to like decorate mm. everything with cray paws. Then you try to stick it yeah. into your tape player, and it would like kind of destroy your tape player. there was <laughs> that yeah <laughs> there was this cray pause thing i don't know what it was all about like i remember once we made a whole cassette that was just pink with cray pause which just like covered the entire thing with cray pause yeah and you can you can smear it or um you can combine it with peanut butter 
then put it in your hair. <laughs> I think there was a lot of stuff being put in our hair in the 80s yes. to make our hair do this. So yeah, I guess we were so sort of... It, it, it's probably worth talking about punk as a movement with nothing to do with sound at all and just hair. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think that there could be... You, you could you could write a, a book about punk for deaf people and have just no reference at all to yeah. sound exactly. being made. Yeah. Because culturally, it's about hair. Yeah. And fashion and film, right? Like, the, you could, you're right, you could do or photography. Like, there's just so many, like, to me, it just opened a door. And anything could come through at that point because to push back on Tapestry and the White Album, those are great records, not taking anything away from the records and, and obviously the motivations of the artists, but they were successful doing that. I think it's different when you approach it like like you're doing, where you guys are disrupting, you, you're playing these shows, you're talking to the audience while you're playing, like right back, watching that Middle East show from way back when, you're talking to the audience, you're engaging with the audience, and it's so no, different. No, that's her. Well, the, it's her, but you do it now too. <laughs> So, a little bit. I do not talk to the audience while I'm playing a song. Not a, not a huge fan of talking to the audience. Steve not a huge fan. Not while playing a music a song. No. No. Okay, but in the middle of a set versus like yeah. Kiss. Yeah, yeah. Or, versus these oh, bands. Oklahoma or whatever. Yeah. yeah, like just disrupting things, and I think that's that's the great thing about this thing. And like we talk about it without the music, without the visuals, without anything. Yeah. This. Um, sorry, uh, it's my turn to have the siren. It's really. <laughs> fire truck going by sorry no problem um, I, didn't, I'm actually I didn't hear the last driving. 10 seconds of what you said no i was just gonna say i feel like this is where there was an honor in doing it yourself and there obviously you're like you're saying there's this diy's existed forever but in a lot of times it was a means to an end like i'm going to try and do this to get to the next stage whereas with punk in terms of pop music it was about no 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 you do it because this is what you do and when I got into it, I was still making my own tapes. I was still photocopying at Kinko's because this was the culture that was handed down to me. And it was not just permission to do it, but here are the tools that you can do it where you don't need much money. You need a little bit of money, but you don't need much money. You don't need access. You can just do it yourself. And that's that's the punk thing. So I am. Um... Uh, I have been invited to have a Substack account. Substack is the way that writers actually get paid nowadays. Um, they get paid directly. It's very DIY. It's it's directly in the in that lineage. Um, and what am I going to do with my Substack account? I'm going to have a zine because, like you say, that's what I that's what I know. I I know how to do that. Um, I am literally going to go to the FedEx Kinkos across the street and copy things onto pink paper um, and whatever color I feel like and uh, and then put it on Substack. Like the distribution will be digital, but the the production will be putting pieces of paper together with staples. And I still find that the way I, that's the way I put stuff together. Like even though I, yeah. I'm, I'm not very good with this computer, so when I'm actually putting together a like I haven't done a zine in a few years, but when I did zines or when I'm doing like a layout for something, I'm going to a photocopy place, cutting stuff out, gluing it down with a glue stick and photocopying, probably not the most efficient way to do things, but like you're saying the that production, and it's not just an aesthetic. It's like a, it's like an ethos in that type of production. Like that, that still rings. Yeah. Using your hands to, to do something. If, using your hands to glue it together with the glue stick is quite different from moving it around with the mouse. Um, uh, thank you for reminding me I need to go get a glue stick. <laughs> I haven't had one in quite a long time. Uh, I bought I a, a fancy one. I've got 10 of them here. Yeah. Sure you do okay. <laughs> yeah. So maybe bring them, bring one. To On rehearsal. tour. <laughs> <laughs> I will come yeah. Yeah. glue sticks for you to rehearsal. Um, yeah, I mean, so in a way, like the the um, you can call this podcast the magnetic fields peeling the onion of authenticity. Um, but I do think that, on the onion of authenticity. Pissing on the onion of authenticity. But I do th I do think that that in a way the the word punk 
as loosely defined as we are doing it is somehow tangentially more, I think, about DIY and maybe stuff like feminism um, and or or expression of feeling some sort of lack of control and wanting to have control. I actually just had this like huge flashback to 1986 CMJ festival where I went um, as a freshman in college and there was, you know, Gerard and, um, and co on their panel and, you know, everybody was, you know, it was like Thurston and can't, you know, it was like such a, such a little New York kind of college. We haven't even talked about college radio, but anyway, the, it was this sort of scene where, you know, it was like all these people kind of knew each other, Byron Cole, you know, it was all these people wandering around who were like, hey, 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 hey. And then there was this, this incredible heavy metal panel. You know the story, Stephen? Mm -hmm. um, I went with Jad Fair to, the, <laughs> to, this, to this panel, which was kind of in itself amazing, right? So yeah. sitting in the heavy metal panel with Jad Fair and... And the thing, and the reason I'm telling the story is it's like the inversion of this entire conversation we're having today because everybody at the panel acted like they were on like, I don't know, Top of the Pops or whatever. I don't know, give me the name of something huge. You know, they were on like the biggest radio show or the biggest TV show in the country. I mean, they were wearing their mirrored glasses and they had their hair perfect and their face perfect and their clothes perfect. And everybody in the room was sort of staring at them. I mean, there were people who genuinely loved, it was like, you know, Mike Monroe from Hanoi Rocks. And, you know, it was, I mean, Lemmy was there from Motorhead. I mean, these were like big shot guys, unfortunately all guys, but but what got, to, hold on, I'll tell the great you. Guys. For that part, yes. Yeah. But what, what, what made it funny, what made it funny was that no one was recording it for national television or national radio. It was just, at the C it was just a panel at CMJ. So in a way that's kind of like, I don't know, the the DIY folks like win on some weird level. You know, like we're all in the room just being, I mean, there were obviously some diehard metal fans who were just like, whoa, yeah, 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 you know, like really excited. But the people on the panel just drank their own Kool-Aid to such an amazing extent that it actually made them kind of amazing. Like it made you in the audience look at them like, wow, like you really are authentic. I don't know how else to put it. Like you really believe in yourself <laughs> to such an unbelievable degree. So like there was this moment where one of them was like, yeah, when our drummer died. And I literally started to laugh because, you know, Spinal Tap had already come out. It was yeah. hilarious. And, and it wasn't funny that his drummer had died, except that it was really funny that his drummer had died. And I don't know what I'm trying to say. I guess what I'm trying to say is that they, they took themselves incredibly seriously and everybody in the room was not up for that task because we had all just been trying desperately to like, I don't know, get our tape to Gerard or whatever for the last four years. And then, and then there's these guys like, anyway, you get my point. Like I get just it. Yeah. acting like so, they were on the biggest station ever or the biggest, yeah. And you found that to be a form of authenticity. Yeah, yeah. They, they, were, they were authentic they in how fake themselves. they were. Yes. Mm -hmm. They really believed in they themselves. They were true to their genre. Yes. They really believed in themselves. They really, oh. like Kiss, like what you were saying, like this idea of, so I guess for Stephen and me, authentic has a, a, a negative connotation, which has to do with buying into your own um, shtick. shtick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although and we I, like it when it's ironic, like Alice Cooper. I mean, we have to believe that Alice Cooper to a certain degree sees through some of this or, oh, or Alice Cooper is, is all about or, the showmanship. Yeah, yeah. Or Ozzy Osbourne or whatever. I mean, these guys are kind yeah, of, yeah, kind no, of they, 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 they have senses of humor and they, right. they share that with right. the audience while. Yes. Keeping up the, the I have to believe that Lemmy was like thinking to himself, what the hell am I doing on this panel? Because he was oh, just yeah. like a regular person. He wasn't dressed like a glam rocker or with like wearing yeah. his sunglasses inside. And <laughs> anyway, it was so he movie. wasn't doing Lemmy. Well, yeah, and, yes. And there's yeah. straight up interviews with Lemmy where he's like, I feel more in common with the punk kids than I do with the metal kids. Yeah. Uh -huh. I didn't feel that from him. He was also, wasn't he just kind of older than everyone? Wasn't everybody in that band kind of yeah, like, yeah. kind of yeah. outlived yeah. their genre or something? And they were just it, so his better. first band he was the lyricist for, and um it's called Sam Gopal. Uh <laughs> they they didn't have a drummer, they had a tabo player. <laughs> the record's amazing it's yeah it's great and then hawkwind stuff the hawkwind stuff he did too like that's yeah, yeah. That, oh i forgot you know, he was that band you know, lemmy is 
a, a lot more wide ranging than his right. uh, later shtick would uh, would allow us to think. Yeah. I mean, he was still writing for Sam Gopal. He's already writing about the Dark Lord, but over tablas. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm really feeling crappy, and I want to go. I get uh, it. I get it. Well, if you want to okay. stick around, Claudia, we can talk more. But if you want to go too, uh, I should probably go with Stephen. But um, yeah. is it like and a last? Not thing? really. No, I, I think you have uh, you have stories that you have not yet told. And I, if I didn't feel crappy, I would continue. But I, I really, I think yeah, I, have I can do like ten minutes. I, I also is it need a to. smaller room. Well, I, I didn't even so, get to ask you about control bleeding or any of this other stuff that's Salem Mort comp anything so or Harriet records I can't believe I didn't talk to you about Harriet records I so, will talk to you about Harriet records well and just... at some point Stephen when you feel better in the future years from now when you can tolerate more of this conversation about punk and stuff please know you're always welcome on this show thank you <laughs> right. I did really want to talk to you about a thousand a hundred thousand fireflies and harriet records because yes. i love that label scarlet drop from canada for the canadian connection there yes. um and it is it's amazing how that single like how many were pressed of it do you know i think it was like like i said we did it over at typo tech which was our local copy store in harvard square um tim alborn was i was uh undergrad at harvard and he was a um professor at harvard and i don't remember if we met at harvard or if we met when i was still in high school but i or in i think somehow we knew each other through like the zine land even before because i came to harvard as a junior i came very late so i think i actually knew him when i was still in my other college in New York. So I don't, I don't actually understand, but Tim and I somehow met, he, he would remember. But then we ended up in the same place, which was kind of convenient. And, and we went to this place, Typo Tech, which was just literally across the street from where all the dorms were and everything. And and we made it, we made, I mean, I don't, I think he must've made it, but we designed this record cover of this metallic record cover. And we made this funky little weird sticker that said, listen to the magnetic fields. I just remember doing it all at Typo Tech. It was like very, handmade and i don't know if we put them in the sleeves i think the typo tech staff put them in the sleeves for us 500 or so or a thousand or it was very small but it got around right because like super chunk covers that song like a year later or two years later uh maybe a little more than that but yeah like really? I think, didn't they do it i don't remember it's on Honestly, a 10 inch i think i think it's on the yeah, 10 inch I mean, no no the question is how fast is the yeah. name of their EP? and i remember that i just don't remember what year it was we could google that but but anyway so um the uh the single i mean this is where we haven't talked about college radio which is just a huge part of our whole story mythology of our lives and i guess most people from that era college radio so in america like steven was saying you can't you can't actually reach all these different fiefdoms and all these different towns but actually college radio and zines and things like that were doing their best right to kind of mush these things around so so I guess it was Jacksonville, Florida, oddly enough, that Tim must have sent all those singles to all those different cool college radio stations around the country. And Jacksonville's college radio station really went crazy with that single. And it went up the CMJ charts. Really, it it, it was through college radio that 100,000 Fireflies made its splash. And then um, we put out this little pop-up records, which has that song on it. It's this the first of the... The, the the first Magnetic Fields album now is a double album, but it was the first of that. It was called uh, Distant Plastic Trees, and we put that out. And then um, we get it like licensed immediately again to another label, and then we get a license to merge. So at some point in like the, God, I'm really bad with dates, but at some point I'm sitting at like, um, oh my God, my brain, the amazing record store in Hoboken. I wish Stephen were here. Anyway, that place. And I run actually ran into Mac from Super Chunk, who I'd gone to my first college with. Both of us transferred out of Columbia, but he and I knew each other when we were kids, like freshmen. And he said, Hey, I wanna, I wanna, can I release, you know, that distant plastic trees record? And I said, Well, we we just signed it to this other company. And then it anyway, the point is it bounced from label to label and then finally got to to merge. And that's the beginning of the merge story. It's interesting too with Mac because that's someone else who I find you know, and talking to him, being on the label and stuff, has that like deep understanding. Pure platters. Pardon me? Pure, Pure platters. platters. 
I Sorry, should... that was the name of the record store. I, I was going to lose my mind. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I find with Mac, it's fascinating because he's got like, he's another person like yourselves that got the Flying Nun stuff. Like, it feels like the Flying Nun stuff was like a secret language. And I, I, I was lucky enough to get it through Homestead and Merge putting out those records. Yes. But it really does feel like that is like the, uh, like a secret code between people. Yeah, Flying Nun. And for us, I mean, we were into the psychedelic scene too in Cal California. So Paisley Underground, we had all these different little, little worlds that we were obsessed with and definitely Rough Trade and all the guys out in England. Um, interestingly, 53rd and 3rd was later for me. I mean, I definitely had my shop assistance records and stuff, but that world, it was more for me. I was, I guess it was just more like, uh, what I just said. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, Mac, I, I, I didn't know him well at Columbia, but we knew each other. And then somehow we ran into other in this record store. I think it was like 1990, 1990 or 90. One and at that point we'd already put out these like I said so he then he then relicensed it and then Stephen was sort of already heading off into new records so he got to package the first two and then it was just weird like the whole early nineties is us just like trying to figure out it's like very it's very amorphous we have all these different record labels and we're trying to figure out which ones and like I said I'm like banging my head against many walls trying to get money from people who won't pay and oh there's all sorts of stories um which you can probably read about in the merge book. And then finally it all just thankfully just consolidated with merge, but we had like two records come out in one year because one label was taking so long and it was just very chaotic. It, it's interesting that you describe like sort of the ascent of the band, because it's, it feels like right from that single getting played on Jackson. And obviously you'd been a band for a long time prior to this or a few years before this, prior to this, but you guys are a part of the, the musical landscape from that point on. Um, well, college radio was really, really great. That's all I have to say. I mean, I of course, because I was a manager and I was trying so hard to push things forward, I wanted to make it to WFNX or WBCN or W, you know, KEXP, whatever. I wanted to get out. out I don't know what these labels, what these uh, places were called. <laughs> yeah. The big K ones in the West Coast. Like I wanted to get K Rock. I want to be on K Rock. We did, oddly enough, we did get played on K Rock with the future Bible Heroes for like one hour of one day we actually had a song on care was so exciting but so i guess i always had this idea that there was something bigger but yes yes there was this sort of teapot of excitement of college radio success and a little bit of recognition that way and you know getting our, our singles on the cmj you know the little disc you got with your cmj catalogs and it's funny it's also far long ago it's like almost like a another person another life but yes there was that little kind of small feeling of recognition. We played a lot. We played a lot of live concerts on our local college radio stations. We did that. We did MBR. We did ZBC. We did HR, whatever it was, Harvard radio station, um, HRB. You know, we did all these. And and I, I always accidentally swore. That was like my problem. Like I'd get up there and be like, don't swear, don't swear, don't swear. You know that weird thing where you're like, you're not supposed to swear. So then you just do. And then they would have to like shut down the entire station for like three seconds and like yell at me. And then anyway, so we did a lot of on air performing in the early nineties or the I, mid I think it was the Well, and I, you, uh, that period, your, the, your bands being collectively the bands of that era really kind of established the the uh the type of band that my band's in obviously sonically very different but the idea that you you don't have to be played on the k-rocks right. and there there is a way to kind of do this as a career in between a hobby band and a professional band like not that we're not professionals but i mean like in terms of like you can make this work as like a a, a cool diy i don't know I, I, i'm now i'm very conscious of what i say stephen's made me double think yeah. everything but yeah, you know well, what i'm saying right like an indie band for lack of a better term yeah yeah he bridled against that term too so i'm glad you didn't bring it up while he was on the call oh, i knew i knew not i was safe with you because but it's if, the word indie but yes. but yes i think indie is is probably the definitional word for that time um not not mainstream right um and, and yet we were all kind of pining for it on so at least I was. I wanted more and more and more. And our parents were all of our parents were like, you gotta go to grad school, you gotta get a real job, you can't, you know. So it, it wasn't like, oh wow, we're really making a career out of this. It was like this is literally our hobby. Except for Steven, who 
was like, this is my job. This is what I do. But the rest of us, I mean, Sam and me and all of us, we were just like, we have to go to grad school and become a whatever, you know, a lawyer, a teacher. He went for law. I went for teaching. We did not think that this was, you know, possible to not have a, be, we had to have a day job. Steve had a day job. Yeah, we all had day jobs. Yeah. And there's still like day jobs are part of, I think, this type of band or like there's a, you have to figure something else to make it work, but there's this idea that you can do this and be, and especially the longevity of yourself, super chunk too. like these bands that it, you don't have to exist in a narrow window, like the right. Beatles or something. You can be a band and make this your life. And your, this is your life's work. Right. right. And, and I yeah, kind of, it's, it's, oh, on, sorry. it's like, a, it is an interesting kind of marriage feeling. Like you just feel like you're very married to it and there's a lot of love in it. And yet, yeah, it's not, Maybe in a weird way, it is like an open marriage because you have your job and you have your other things that you do and your other identities that you can take off and put on. So you don't feel as, um, like I thought it was really, I don't know, inspiring or something that Laura graduated to not being in the band. And I almost, within a year or two of that, stopped being in my band too. Like, you know, she had ear problems and she was like, I'll be on the records, but I can't do this touring thing anymore. And I, that felt really brave. And I, I'm sure it was medically necessary too, but it also felt kind of brave because of the identity of this. And I, I also, you know, I had to, at a certain point I had a kid and I, I just was like, this isn't working, you know? So I too stopped for, I don't know, a decade. Um, that was intense, you know, mm -hmm. but I was still on the records and still managing it and still very involved. And, but but not having that like excitement of the limelight and being on stage, it, it's yeah, it's definitely something hard to shed. Did you miss it? Like, was that something that was hard to kind of like put away? I miss some things. I was very jealous. I think that's the better phrase. Like, mm -hmm. oh man, they're in Cork, Ireland. I want to be in Cork. And I had that feeling all the time. You know, like, oh, they're in you know Athens. I want to be in Athens. I'm in Brooklyn. I want to be in Athens. You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're in they're they're going to places i've never been you know they went to uh, i don't know was it chile last year they they went somewhere in latin america that i've never been i think some were very far away um so that's cool right that's cool and they got to play really big festivals and that was cool too so yeah kind of jealous but also very much realizing that i can't have two lives at the same time i have a teen a preteen teen and nobody's going to feed her if i'm not <laughs> If I'm not there and I have another career too, I'm working as a social worker now. So yeah, it's hard. It's hard to not want to have it all. I, you know, but I've sort of come to, I had to go through something, but now I've sort of come to a place of understanding. I'm I'm asking this on a personal level because I find that it, it's, it's the double life of trying to, to raise kids, especially preteens, teenagers, yeah. and then also go on the road and be this sort of perpetual teenager living this yeah. sort of like teenage fantasy of being in a touring band in a van. Yeah. No, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm not doing much of it anymore. So that's my answer. I think that boys have a little bit of a way out. If you have a female partner at home who's being more of like the mom, I think, it, I think it's a little harder for mom to take off than dad. I know that's sexist of me. And I, it's just, I just happen to have that kind of gender essentialism in me that maybe is wrong. Uh, a little old school, but I guess I feel like having been raised by a dad who had to work all the time to make money anyway, I just feel like, well, didn't see a whole lot, <laughs> didn't see a whole lot of him either. So, you know, it's, it, that's mean, I'm sorry, but you know, it, obviously I love my dad and I loved the time I spent with him, but it, it, I think it would have been a little more harsh and intense and maybe even traumatic if it had been mom who had taken off as much as um, my dad did. So um, that's just what I've been raised with and maybe it's wrong. I don't know. Well, it, 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 but there is that choice that has to be made, though, like you're saying, like there's you can't be at home and be in this band at the same yes. time. And it's right. and something's got to give. And then it's funny. Well, I'll talk to like I forget who it was. Someone from like a really big band was like, yeah, being on the road's real hard. But, you know, it's great because we bring our kids on the road. And and yeah. I was just thinking it does not work for the type of economic band that I'm in to do that. We, br we brought my daughter in 2012, which was the last time I toured with them, um, for nine weeks. She was 18, 16 to 18 months old. And it was really an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> I will, I would not do that again. It was a bad idea. She had a great, great time running all over the airport, but I was beyond exhausted. 
and uh, having panic attacks every day because I was like, I just can't physically keep up this energy level. I can't be up until two and then up at seven in the morning. And then I, yeah, la, la. I was such a wreck. Um, and I had some help. I had a person who came along, but it just, it even, it was too much even for them. It was just so much to do that. Um, so anyway, I waited a decade. Now she's 13. It's easier. And um, I will be going out with them for, for, you know, a month and it, it will be hard. It will be hard to not, but I can text with her and, you know, she can stay at friends' houses now. It's a little less intense, but yeah. I, I think you deserve a medal for doing that. <laughs> That's fucking crazy. Like, Well, I did stop touring for like, yes. forever <laughs> after that. I just like, I had to get very quiet and alone for a long time after that. I was a wreck. I really do. Th I think I may have had like a mini nervous breakdown after that. I was really a wreck. But um, anyway. I, I think it requires, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. I, I think it requires two very different mentalities uh, to be the parent versus being the rock star, quote unquote, the person on stage. Cause yeah. one is you can't be selfish at all when you're raising your kids. It has to be about them. Right. But if you, if you're not selfish as that person on stage, it doesn't work. Like if you don't believe you can fly, you're going <laughs> to crash to the ground. So like the, I find That's it like, yeah. I, well, I, and I couldn't imagine trying to do that at the same time. I find there's like a weird, day after i get off tour trying to readjust like oh it's not about me right yeah but to yeah. try and do that every day like you're doing that is well uh, that was she was so little that that wasn't actually in play that much the only thing that was like that that was really quite heartbreaking for me was that the next year i went out with future bobble heroes for just um like a week um and she and i guess that the first year she never came to any sound checks or shows because she was so little she was a year and a half old but the next year she was like three and so we let her stand in the bell house during sound check. And she heard my voice like above through the big speakers. And she didn't have a concept of like microphones or amplification or except for, I guess, listening to a, a CD at home. But like, you know, she didn't have this concept that like the person could be talking and then you could hear this like huge giant version of their voice amplified all over the place. And she just burst into tears hysterically and was really distraught and her my friends who were minding her like like kind of swooped her up and ran home with her and just like played with her and like distracted her and by the time I got there after sound check she was smiling and laughing and I but I was so worried about how devastated she had gotten and I actually after that we really kept her out of the venues she she did in the very last future Bible hero show which was like 10 days later she did um I don't know how she got her head around it. First, we we showed her, I guess, through the window, me on stage. And then she finally, we finally walked her in and she actually danced. And it was really moving for me. Awesome. It was at, um, yeah, it was at, uh, you know, that place that they record um, Terry Gross. What is it? Kate. Um, anyway, it's that it's there's there's a there's a, a venue associated with the um, Philadelphia radio station. I'm sorry, my brain is just gone completely out the window but um it'll come to me anyway this is a problem i'm having lately i forget everything but but anyway it was it was a very small very pretty little venue so it didn't seem like um she was going to be as freaked out because it was sort of quiet and anyway so what do you want to talk about that's like for the for the podcast that you can <laughs> you can edit in edit in there's anything we talked about harry this is great i like this has been amazing like I, I would love to talk to you like i don't want to keep you all day because honestly it'd be it yeah, I, i've got I so can, many can nerdy go. things but oh. <laughs> like it's there's like i i would love the the uh, like okay one last thing how did you how did that manuals of insect life comp which i think is the first appearance of magnetic fields on a on a re release right that comp yeah. um that one is lost to the sands of time. I think it must have been through a, you know, somebody reading a review in a zine. The guy at Salem Moore, he had a French name. I've lost it. I'm sure we could find it by looking. Gerard at Helm or Woodrow Dumas? Yeah, Dumas, that guy. Yeah. yeah. He contacted me back then, I guess, through the mail. That's about as far as I'm going to get with that. Must have seen the P.O. box on the back of the record and said, I want to do a single. And we were like, sure. And we gave him Crowd of Drifters sung by Susan, which is actually interesting because that song appears years later on the Charm of the Highway Strip. That's 
like three years later or something like that. So he must have written that song. That was the, what I was trying to say about the early 90s. Everything was sort of mixed. Like there was a lot of records in production. Stephen had a lot of ideas in his mind and he made like so many records in a row and they all kind of came out like kind of mushed. So so yeah, we made the Marvels of Insect Life single, but then also that very same song came out on a different album sung by him a couple of years later. It's amazing how quickly you you had that sound for this band. Like the Buffalo Rome show, obviously what you're doing now is much more developed or what Magnetic Fields now is much more developed, but like it's there. Sam is there playing the cello. Yeah. In 1988. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's still there playing the cello in 2024. It's totally insane. Um, I think Sam is a huge part of the of the definition of that because he had his cello the whole time. So, and um, I was a drummer until the late '90s, and then when '69 Low Songs came out, I switched to. And by the way, this is something you should just tack into the podcast because this is a relevant statement. We've been talking a lot about genre. Obviously, the title of the podcast turned out punk, right? It's about genre. Stephen, when he made '69 Love Songs, and I think I can say this safely on his behalf. He was trying to peel the onion of that on every level, every level, right? Just like when he talks about Carol King or he talks about the Fugs or anybody, he's just saying this is all is what Brian Eno would say, right? It's all apparatus around the composition that makes it the genre. Mm -hmm. I understand. Agree. Like six, you absolutely agree, right? So there's 69 songs, and they're all of him making fun of that point, right? Like he's he's saying like it could be country. It could be, you know, big band. It could be punk. Yeah, because it's just a bunch of idiots on stage dancing around making noise until you imbue it with meaning. And that's what that's what we're always doing, right? We're like, this is not just people making fools of themselves on stage. This is important because it it, it has resonance and, and it, it causes but the genre emotion. too is the song itself is a composition that generally speaking is not its own genre like you can mm -hmm. play a country song in a punk way as we all know because mm -hmm. the punks took the 50s songs and made them punk so it, it, i guess that's what that's you're right that the, the 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 substance of the of this call has been about how punk isn't really about music it's about this ethos because actually the songs themselves could be done in any genre that's like think what i'm trying to say so he's taking 69 love songs. He's making a point about that. He's saying like, I can talk, I can write a song in any genre. Like it's not about I am an indie guy or I'm a blues guy or I'm a R and B guy or I'm a whatever guy. I'm, I'm just a songwriter. And here's, here's a whole lot of different genres, including punk. That's a perfect way to end it. But now to <laughs> for, insert myself into it one more time, but like, I feel like that box set coming out here in that 99, as like a punk kid like and it, and, and punk kid prior to that had been like how real like quote unquote real can you make this how like stripped down how like emotional but hearing that it's it it gave permission for ambition in a way that you can make something like why can't you make something like this and obviously right. songwriting skills and everything excluded but like why can't i do that too and that's what i think that record outside of the music on it is so important because it is like ambition doesn't have to be the Beatles making the white album. Ambition can be your band making something that you believe in. That's awesome. Well, this has been awesome, Claudia. And anytime <laughs> you want to come back by yourself or you want to come back, or if you want to come back with Steven, you are always welcome here. Thank you so much. It's been so fun. told you this was a spicy one. Oh, I love it. I love this episode. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen and Claudia. Claudia and Stephen for coming on the show. You are both welcome back uh, whenever you want. And we can do this again. I got more. I got more debate stuff to debate. Check out the episodes, though, with The Clean. Uh, because that, that Flying Nun Records, 100% punk stuff. That's the thing. Don't let anyone define punk for you. Define it yourself. Because... Everybody's somebody's poser. Everyone's got the wrong definition of this thing. And uh, that's what makes it so perfect. All right. I could ramble on about the magnetic fields and I could ramble on about punk forever, but I should not be doing that. I should be heading off to bed. But before I do, I got to tell you what's coming up on the next episode. The next episode will be 
Arthur Rizik from uh, God, Cold World, Iron Age, Power Trip, War Hungry, uh, producer of countless records, master of countless records, just a, uh, a, a musical genius currently on tour with, uh, the, a, with eternal champion. If you've not heard this band, they are godly Tarpy from Iron Age on vocals. Uh, Summerland, I believe is on the tour as well. I think Arthur still plays in them too. I will have this all figured out for the next episode, but in the meantime, check out the music of Arthur, check out the music of the magnetic fields. And uh, check out some of those Turned Under Punk classics that are going up in the feed. There are some good episodes in those. Oh my gosh, some of my favorites. Going back and re-listening to that. All right, that's it for me. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives and issues of indigenous peoples all over the world matter. We need to protect trans kids and help trans people protect themselves and their rights and stop hate and violence towards people of different faiths, different identities, different races different nationalities because uh, we're not talking about politics. This is just human rights, ceasefires, permanent ceasefires. That's just basic human rights. People deserve to be able to live free from hate and violence and discrimination. So if there's organizations that are affecting positive change in your community. Get involved. Donate your time, donate your money, whatever. I'm sure they could uh, use that support. Speaking of using support, Get involved in your local scene, start a band, start doing shows, start making flyers, start a podcast, do make a tape. Because uh, this culture gets better when you contribute to it, and anyone can contribute to this thing. And that's the thing that makes punk great. Maybe not a podcast, there's enough of these. <laughs> no, start a podcast. Uh, sign your organ donor cards, because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't need them anymore. And uh, they can perform miracles. I've seen it happen with my own eyes. And uh, try meditating. It's something I got to do more often. And whenever I do, it feels amazing. Took me a long time to get to the stage, though, with it. And uh, if you're finding it frustrating, just stick with it. If I can do it, I guarantee you can. And uh, that is it. I don't think I got anything more. Oh, man. Voice is shredded. That's it for me.